Um, our guest speaker tonight is Brian Heath. He is with the Forest Service. He is a forest health specialist working in um, the 42 counties in the western portion of North Carolina. And I will go ahead and turn things over to him and let him introduce himself a little bit more and go ahead and get started. All right, well, um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I, my name is Brian Heath. I've worked with the Forest Service for 20 some years, closer to 30 than 20. So I've been around for a little while. Uh, and like, I really enjoy the job that I have now as a forest health specialist. I get to basically work with insects, diseases, things that kill trees, try to figure out what's going on with them, see if there is a way to fix things. I'm also being proactive, looking for invasive insects, invasive diseases that haven't shown up yet doing surveys and things like that. So that's kind of a quick rundown of, of what I do. And uh, like Brianna said, I, I work the, basically from Greensboro to Murphy. So I cover a lot of territory, see a lot of things. Uh, don't know a whole lot about the coastal stuff, but I still try to stay somewhat current with it. But um, anyhow, I'm going to talk about several different pests tonight. And um, let's see if I can get my screen going here. Let's see here. There it is, I think. So um, just going ahead and want to thank you all for being here too. Just, um, I know there's other things you could be doing at 6.30. There's probably Jeopardy or the Olympics or Wheel of Fortune or something that's on that's probably much more entertaining and interesting than what I'm going to talk about. But anyhow, we'll we'll give it a try and see how things go. But um, let's see here. I'm trying to get my screen to move forward. There we go. So um, this is not my normal style of doing uh, presentations, but we do what we have to do with uh, what we're dealt with. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is a spotted lantern fly, and it's a really pretty insect when you paint it out like this and its wings are spread out. Usually you just see the the top wings that are just kind of the gray and the black, so it's not nearly as pretty in person, and it's definitely not pretty when you see what it does. Uh, this is one of our the newest pets that are our newest pests that are coming down the line that uh, we need, need to worry about a little bit. So um, just some general information. It was originally found in China, um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam. Um, not sure why they didn't mention North Korea. Maybe they don't want to cause an international incident or anything like that, but uh, it's uh, definitely from Asia and it's starting to create some havoc in, in our world. It was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014. It's not yet established in North Carolina, but um, wouldn't surprise me if it uh, shows its face a lot in North Carolina this year. That's my crystal ball prediction. It's hard to say for sure. Nobody ever knows, but this is kind of what we're dealing with. So this is uh, the most current map I could find from first part of this month. And all this blue is areas where a spotter and lanternfly has been established where you can go and you can find the insect or life stages of the insect, things like that. It's not just a, a moth here and you squash it and go on. There's actually um, population of moths and it's kind of worked its way down. It got into Virginia here in Frederick County. It was got established there for several years and it's just kind of moving down Interstate 81. And in, just last year, it was found in Carroll and Wyeth County in Virginia, just above um, Surrey County. North Carolina border. So that's that's kind of discouraging, kind of getting us braced. And these little purple dots over here, years seven or eight here in North Carolina, um, all I can say is that purple dots usually lead to blue squares. And so there's pretty good chance with all these purple dots, some places are going to start turning up blue. I do know, uh, or I have heard from several places um, in Union County specifically where Spotter and lantern fly was found. It was found at an airport, apparently a um, old World War II or some type of uh, vintage aircraft from World War II or, or later uh, has been up in Pennsylvania for an exhibition or something like that. And when summer was over, it flew back down to North Carolina, down to Union County and it landed. And a couple people saw some of these um, insects flying out of the back of the plane uh, supposedly they squashed them all, but um, there's always a chance a couple got out or some people didn't really know exactly what they were when they started flying. So it's been, that's where your all's little purple dot came from. And there's been other instances like that across the state. So with it knocking at our door and um, the things that we've seen happening around us, it's a good chance that we'll show up here 
sometime this this summer. Maybe we'll get lucky and hopefully I'm wrong, but we'll we'll see what happens. So talking about the insects, uh, they all have insects all have a life cycle. They hatch from an egg and then they eventually grow up into a full fledged bug or insect or whatever you want to call it. So this is um, the nymph stage. It's very unique. It's got the black color and the and the white dots scattered on it. And um, that's what you'll see in the springtime, basically. They're usually an eighth of an inch to a half inch in size. Nothing huge or anything, but if you see a bunch of them crawling around, that's probably what you're dealing with. Then the next phase, which is kind of cool, got this red color in there. Um, it's just something that's very unique. That's usually late summer. Can go on into December, most likely it's gonna end up summer, late summer to early fall is when you're gonna see this guy. And then this is what the, the leaf hopper or the uh, spotter and lanternfly actually looks like. It's gonna be about an inch in size and it's gonna have the dots and not nearly as attractive and definitely more of a nuisance than what you thought it would be earlier. So this is what the eggs look like. These are called egg masses. And this is actually the individual eggs. What will happen is the female will lay these individual eggs, 30 to 50, eggs in the area and then over here you can see where she's covered it up with a little protective coating to try to help get the eggs through the winter and so they can hatch in the next spring. So you get a female producing 30 to 50 new individuals. It doesn't take very long for these insects to reproduce and their numbers to go up quite a bit. And so the main thing about insects is we're worried about the type of damage. <coughs> Excuse me. So they have a piercing mouth part, and that will actually break through the surface layer of the leaf, uh, the branches, even the trunk. And what they're doing is they're just trying to suck, suck sap out of the tree. And that's what they live on is that sap. And so when they're piercing a leaf, it can cause the leaf to curl, can even cause some wilting. Uh, a lot of times when they get on the branches, that will cause multiple leaves to wilt. It's kind of slowing down the nutrients getting to the leaf and then you can if you get enough of those insects uh, trying to pierce it with their sucking mouth parts you will get some dieback on some of your trees or your plants. The good thing is that plant death at this point has only been noticed in grapevines, tree of heaven, and some small saplings. So it's not like it's wiping out our, our forest or anything like that. There's still um, a lot to learn about this pest. It's constant. It's fairly new, constantly things changing, new research. So there may be some some more information comes down just after tonight's meeting or something. I haven't been involved in a lot of uh, meetings here the last month or so, so there may be some new information. But this is what we know, at least what I know as of the last couple of weeks. And the insects, the worst part about them is they create a honeydew substance which is gonna be really messy. It's kind of like if you've heard that the, mat, the ants milk the aphids. So you get the insect actually secretes a sugary substance uh, that gets on the bark or the tree or wherever they happen to be. And then that secretion starts to grow a mold and it turns black. And so you get a black sooty mold, which is really nasty. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So the primary host is tree of heaven, which that's a very invasive species, so it's like, fine, let them do what they want to a tree of heaven. If it causes mortality, that's great. So it, we don't mind losing this tree. The problem is this tree of heaven is very prolific in a lot of different places. And so if you have a huge host, they can support a lot of these uh, insects. So you get a lot of spotted lanternflies growing because you have a lot of tree of heaven around. And so it kind of actually makes things much worse. Most of the time, these insects, like I mentioned earlier, are just more of a stress factor than, than causing damage, but they can damage a couple of things. So the agriculture settings, the, the worst things, we do know that they do cause damage to hops, to grapes, apples, and other fruit trees. And I usually don't get to talk about alcohol during a presentation or a conference, but uh, today's your lucky day. It's an opportunity with, with talking about hop damage and beer, you can't help but think about grape and wine and apples and hard cider and stuff. So um, this is, it can get your attention really quick, especially if you need something like this to calm down after a long day at work or in the evenings or while you're watching Wheel of Fortune or something. Uh, so it, it definitely gets people's attention. And so you don't get to have many opportunities to make beer jokes. I've been doing this for a long time. Don't get that many opportunities, but this is the easiest 
calmest one I could find. It was not offensive, but it, beer doesn't make you too fat. It can make you lean against bars, tables, and walls and stuff like that. So trying to make something funny out of something that's not in don't know if it's working or not because I can't see anybody, but we'll we'll go on to our next slide. So the, the crop damage, this is what's concerning. And usually when we're dealing with force pests and problems, you'll see the worst case scenario that's on the presentation. It'll be a whole bunch of trees that are dead and wiped out. And that's the worst case scenario. It doesn't always happen during the, the average situation. But from what I've been told, this is typical of what you find with spotter and lanternfly. I haven't seen it personally. I'm afraid we'll find out here soon, but you can see all these moths mixed in here amongst these grapes. And this whole branch is just covered with moths on this apple tree and apple orchard. It's one of those things that it's not, it's, it's controllable, but you're gonna have to do more spraying uh, more issues to deal with it. So you can have some pretty significant reduction in your, your products and your crop productions and things like that with this pest. Um, it's just one of those things, well, we've got to spray more pesticides, um, more insecticides, do some more treatments, things like that. So it's going to raise costs, um, have potentially more damage if you don't do it in the right time, things like that. So it can be definitely be an aggravation and a, and a problem down the road. This is what I'm thinking we're going to see is, is the worst part for a general homeowner. You've got on the left, you've got a tree of heaven. That's where the it actually is wilting because of spider and lantern flies. But the biggest problem is this picture on the, the right where you've got these insects on the base of a tree. And it's you can see where it's causing some wounds, but it's also starting to get that black sooty mold to it. And that's where... Nobody wants black city mold on their trees, on their cars, on their patio, things like that. So here's another close up of that black city mold. Like I mentioned earlier, it's the result of the honeydew and then that that fungus that growing on it to create that that black color. And it can get really nasty. This is somebody's yard tree. You can see them all over this tree. You just don't want that around your house. I've heard of stories where um, specifically in uh, Frederick County, um, some folks that I know went up and saw them and they were at hospitals where there were glass doors or something and they were just all piled up right up there at the front door like a one or two inches thick trying to get in just being a complete nuisance. So you can see where there are definitely problems with with having this in your front yard like that. And again the main host again is Tree of Heaven but the problem tree of heaven, like I mentioned earlier, it's everywhere and it likes open grown or likes wood edges. So you've got interstates that you have the road then you have the grass and then you have the woods and you have that edge between the grass and the woods that's where tree of heaven likes to go and so if you have this whole bunch of host tree of heaven down interstate 81 or down i-77 then that's a good way for them to get established and to move very quickly into north carolina and so it's also spread by people you saw those little egg masses they can lay egg masses on dog houses or toys or things that are outside, picnic tables or something, and then somebody moves and brings them with them. It's kind of like Gypsy Moth does the same thing. So it's it's one of those situations where it's probably, it's just a matter of time. We can try to be proactive, but it's the, the odds are stacked against us with it coming here sooner or later. So the problem is they're, they are easy to kill, but the problem is it's not practical. It's not a very easy practical thing to do you are able to scrape the egg masses off of trees using um, some type of scraping tool or putty knife or something like that. You can put tree banding on that'll go around the tree and it'd be sticky and they can get caught on that banding as they're going up and down the tree and stuff. So you can reduce the population some that way. You can also get rid of the tree of heaven and try to get rid of those, get rid of the host material that maybe that will reduce the population of the insects. You can do chemical control, but again, it's the, the hard part is you have to get that chemical, most likely get in contact with that insect. So you have to physically spray that insect. You can do some systemic treatments and have some control where you um, put some chemical in the ground around the tree and it takes it up, but it takes a while for all of that to happen. And it's, it's kind of a, it's going to knock down some of the population in your particular area, but it, it may come back the next year from your neighbor's house or from the highway or wherever. So um, just not, not very practical for your average homeowner to try to control these things. 
And so, again, a lot of this stuff comes from Asia. I like to blame Walmart on it a little bit since that's where we started outsourcing a lot of stuff and getting stuff in here. So um, it's just a little jab, but uh, that's, that's the society that we live in. We're a very global economy and you may, we save a lot of money on the front end, but we are gonna pay on the back end for stuff like this. There are gonna be crates that get brought in with insects stuck to the side of them, living inside the pallets, inside the packing material, and you let it out. It comes out here in America where there are no natural predators. And then all of a sudden you've got insects, diseases, plants growing where they shouldn't be growing without any way to control them or knock them back. So that's just uh, where we are. So I'm gonna go into the next insects. I'm gonna talk about emerald ash borer and then finish up with sudden oak death. And then I think we'll do questions at the end. Hopefully that works well with everybody. Uh, the emerald ash borer, it's a, it's a pretty bug. I've seen them there here in North Carolina. It's a, it's a pretty, like if you wanted a metallic paint for a sports car or something like that, that's, that's a pretty cool color. But again, they're, they're causing all kinds of problems as well. They're all over the United States. They showed up in Michigan around 2002. And so as you can see in 20 years, it's 30 states or so, something like that, that have these insects established in there, all these red dots. Didn't take them long to spread. And if you notice the um, the last map here is from October 1st, 2020. I think after that point, they, the APHIS and USDA has just pretty much said, sorry, we can't control this pest anymore. We're not gonna try to quarantine it anymore. It's just, we've spent a lot of money, tried a lot of things and we're not successful. And it's something that we're just gonna have to live with. So there are no current quarantines anymore for this pest. As you can see, it's it's halfway across the country and, and doing all kinds of damage there. So we did find it in North Carolina in 2013. It's been documented in over 60 of our counties. Uh, definitely everywhere, all of the area I work from Greensboro to Murphy, it has been positive. I'll show you a map here in a minute. And it's um, it didn't take long from 2013 till, till now to affect the majority of North Carolina. So as you can see, it's it's here and there's a county or two that probably will be red really soon. Somebody just hasn't found the right tree or documented it in the right way, but um, it's it's here in North Carolina and it's it's doing damage, killing trees left and right. And it's uh, it's unfortunate. The one the one thing about ash trees is that they are a hardwood. So they look like a lot of other trees that are hardwoods with just broad leaves and things like that. So when one green tree with leaves dies, another green tree with leaves shows up, it's a different species, but you, it's not as noticeable as some of the other species that are dying off like hemlocks or things like that. So it's not good environmentally by any means, but as far as a um, concern for the general public, if it's not in their yard, they're probably not gonna notice this. Uh, ash is about a 2% component of our forest. So it's a fairly small, but it's still an important species. It's not something we just want to throw away. And it's um, very important if you like baseball, that's what the Louisville Slugger Company uses to make their bats. And um, without ash trees, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. I think they're looking at maples, other, other types of hardwood trees, but they're, it was something about the, the way they grew the ash trees with just the right growth rings made the, the best baseball bats. So, and it's got other They've used it for other furniture and, and um, different types of cabinetry and stuff like that as well. So it's still, it's a tree, a forest component, a forest product that we, we will miss if it becomes extinct or gone and out of the North Carolina environment. So some signs and symptoms to look for. Uh, if you have an ash tree, first you have to be able to identify an ash tree because it's, it. if you know what you're looking for, it's fine to identify it, but a lot of people just think it's a, they don't know if it's an ash tree or oak tree. So first you figure out if it's an ash tree. Then you look for a thinning crown, uh, bark splits, woodpecker damage, epicormic branching, and D-shaped exit holes. And so I've got a picture for each one of those kind of give you an idea. So this is an ash tree with a thinning crown. Typically the emerald ash borer starts at the top of the tree and works its way down. Um, it makes it kind of hard initially to prove that you had emerald ash borer because until you could see some of the insect or the galleries, at the base of the tree, you didn't know, you couldn't confirm that you had it unless you cut it down. And we couldn't go down cutting everybody's trees. So um, 
that was something that said, look, this is a, a good possibility. It's infested with the emerald ash borer and they will start top and work their way down like that. And so you'll have dead branches, live branches, but a couple of years, two, three years, you can have mortality. It can be pretty quick acting. So you got the thinning crown, uh, the bark splits and what's happening there with the bark, you can see the little bit of wood underneath that, the sap wood. And if you look real close, you've got little galleries in there. So what's happened is that um, the larvae underneath the bark, the insect has actually eaten away a lot of that wood underneath the bark. And it basically causes the bark to die and splits. And so you'll see these cracks where they are basically present underneath of the, the bark there in the tree. And woodpecker damage, woodpeckers are going after the insects. Their ash trees are when EAB, emerald ash borer, gets into a tree, there's lots and lots of um, insects in a tree to kill it. And woodpeckers will go after these insects. They're apparently pretty tasty. They can't do enough good to, to save the tree, but they do get quite a few meals off of it. So you will see a lot of woodpecker damage on an ash tree. That's a pretty good sign. Epicormic branching. These are the leaves and small branches, usually at the base of the tree. That's just a sign of stress, like you saw earlier where you had the crown of the tree starting to die. A tree needs those leaves to produce chlorophyll, produce sugars and starches to make that tree stay alive. If you don't have photosynthesis, you're not going to have a live tree. So it's losing these leaves. So in desperation, the tree takes these dormant buds, busts them out, has leaves growing on these small branches to try to create more photosynthesis to try to keep it alive. So typically, not always, when you see this epicormic branching, that's a sign of severe stress. There are some other things, if you get sudden sunlight exposure or stuff that it could be, but typically um, stress is a big concern there. And there's your D-shaped exit hole. It's um, about an eighth inch in diameter. That's that's pretty much your telltale sign. You'll see the galleries and you'll see that exit hole. There are other insects that make that, that exit hole, but not in ash trees, especially not in what used to be healthy ash trees. So you see that little exit hole, then you know you've got a, got a problem. And it looks much bigger on the screen in person. It's an eighth of an inch, it's pretty small. And it's, I think sometimes eighth of an inch is a little bit, it's on the, the shorter side of an eighth of an inch. So it's definitely not um, real obvious until you pay close attention and start looking for it. So there's actual larva. So what happens is the emerald ash borer, the beetle actually lays an egg on the bark of the tree. That egg hatches and it bores right into that tree underneath the bark. And this is the, the larva stage. This is what does all the damage. It's doing all the eating underneath the bark. It's eating that sap wood. And it has these distinct bell shapes to it. So that's that's another identifying characteristic of this pest. So you can kind of see the galleries in here. And then here's another picture of the galleries that that insect creates, that larva creates all of these galleries here. And that just basically strangles the tree because the nutrient flow is supposed to be going up and down the tree right there. And you've got these galleries that are breaking that off and it just uh, break off that supply chain. And we all know that breaking off the supply chain is not a good thing. It doesn't help anybody out. Just like trees, it can't get what it needs to survive and it ends up dying. And we're losing millions and millions of ash trees. It's, it's a pretty good chance that this will be like the chestnut blight. Uh, you'll, there's a good chance we'll lose ash trees as a forest component um, across the country. It's been pretty significant. We've lost a lot of trees very, very quickly um, in our country since in the last 20 years. That's a, we've lost a lot of trees for a 20 year time period. Take a quick sip of water here. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I do have information if anybody's interested at the end of the program. There are ways you can treat your ash trees. You can't really treat them on a broad scale, but you can treat, if you have a yard tree that's important to you, <clears throat> you can save it. You want to treat now. Uh, you usually want to do it early spring. So, I mean, here within the next couple of weeks is probably when you need to start treating it between March and April to get the new, you can treat it systemically. You can pour the chemical around the base of the tree or inject it into the tree and get it into the tree quickly to help prevent damage from when the emerald ash borer becomes more active in this, this warmer weather. There are different types of uh, chemicals that you can use. Imidacloprid is a very basic chemical. It's actually what you put on your dog to uh, prevent fleas. You can actually just pour it right on their shoulders and it knocks down the fleas. So it's a, it's a chemical that's used a lot that we're 
feel fairly comfortable with. There's other chemicals, Safari is one, it's more expensive. The midcloprid you can do on your own, you're probably looking about, if you do it on your by yourself, you could probably treat it for less than a dollar an inch in diameter of the tree. Uh, if you do imamectin benzoate, you're looking at several hundred dollars a tree, probably 15, 20 dollars per inch in diameter. It's significantly more expensive. Metacloprid will last one year and have moderate control. The imamectin benzoate will last two to three years and much, much better control. But it's it's something that's going to cost money or cost time or both, and you have to keep up with it. If you forget it for a year or two, you'll probably lose your tree. So it's something that you have to to follow through and and follow up with on a regular basis. And again, springtime is the best time you do it when it's taking up the nutrients and water from the soil to bust out the leaves. It's also going to take up this chemical. And um, so that's you can do soil drench, stem injection, basal bark. And if you have any questions on that more specifics. I can definitely discuss that later on or at the end when we have some questions that want to spend a bunch of time on, on chemical treatments. So you always get questions about biological control. Can we bring something in to kill this pest? It's very difficult to bring in a biocontrol agent from another country. First, you have to hope go through a lot of testing to make sure it's not going to escape, do things it shouldn't do. You can never guarantee it 100%, but you can at least um, make every effort to see that it's a fair, fairly safe uh, process or insect that you're bringing in. It's usually a combination when you have emerald ash borer, it's probably a combination of what's keeping it in check in its native countries and its native continent. It's not usually just one thing, but you look at these options Biocontrol is just a really hard thing to make it stick. Uh, we've had some success with biocontrol, but most of the time it's we're too far behind to really be considered successful. A lot of times what happens is your, your trees that you're trying to save, the pests that are killing them, you get down to where you've lost 75% of your plants, your host type. And when you do that, you've also lost 75% of the insect that's causing the damage, say your emerald ash borer. So we finally get those emerald ash borer populations very, very low because you don't have any host type for them. And then when you get to that point, that's when the biological control can start having enough of a chance to catch up and knock out some of those emerald ash borers. And then maybe you can reintroduce ash trees or reintroduce these things and have more of a balance. But it usually, most of the time, it's going to have to get to a really bad point before you can start bringing it back again. So this insect is a wasp and everybody gets scared when you say a wasp. It's really, really small. This is uh, somebody's finger. Her name's actually Kelly. She used to work with us and this is her finger and this is the biocontrol agent. So these guys cost anywhere from a couple of dollars to $10, $20 a bug, depending on what type of biocontrol insect you're buying. I don't know how much these cost, but any type of biocontrol is gonna be expensive. So it's a very, very small insect. It does not sting, which is good. What this insect does is it lays its egg inside the larvae in that worm stage with the little bells on it um, while it's alive. And then the egg hatches and it kind of like alien the movie or whatever, it, it eats out the inside of the, the larvae and then comes out in, as an adult. So that's kind of how it works. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name. In fact, I think this name has changed since I made this slide several months ago. So, but anyhow, we'll just call it a biocontrol agent and go with that. But it's it's something that we are looking at. It's the only thing biocontrol, once it gets an insect pest gets to the point where we can't control it on our own by eradication methods or chemicals or things like that. Biocontrol is really the only feasible option, but it's expensive and it takes a long time and there's there's no guarantee. So it's just something that we have to to follow up on, I know we've released probably 70,000 or more of these insects in North Carolina. We're trying and we'll just see, see what happens with that. And we have tried all kinds of eradication and control methods, um, especially when it started up north, like uh, kind of we, but it was they, they um, tried chipping up all the infested wood, uh, burning it, bulldozing it, clearing out buffer strips, things like that nothing nothing worked there's just no way we there's no way to stop this pest it's once it's one of those things once it's out of the barn you can't get it back in the barn and this is kind of one of those situations and here are this is a map that's specific for north carolina 
and its focus is on firewood. You try to, we try to tell people not to move firewood or keep it within like a 50 mile radius of where you cut down the tree because chances are whatever killed the tree when you cut it down, you'll probably carry that pest with you when you go to a campground somewhere else to another state or thing. So kind of encourage that, but you can see there's a lot of things coming at North Carolina. You've got um, Asian longhorn beetle that's kind of got established down around the Charleston area. You've got laurel wilt, which I didn't worry about it because that was a coastal plain for uh, Red Bay um, and killing Red Bay in those areas, but apparently it gets on sassafras now. And so it's actually shown up in areas in Tennessee and places like that in Georgia, yeah, in Georgia here and stuff. So we've got it to worry about with sassafras trees. You've got the emerald ash borer, which is what I talked about. Uh, gypsy moth is in Virginia. It's kind of creeping down in North Carolina, but we've been holding it back pretty well with a combination of different treatments and factors going on there. A thousand cankers disease hitting walnut trees. It's out here around the Smokies. Doesn't seem like it's doing too much damage, but you just, it's one of those things you never know about. You just have to monitor. So uh, one thing about North Carolina, it's got a lot of a lot of variety. You got a lot of variety of trees. You got a lot of variety of weather, but also that extra variety um, can host a lot of variety of bad stuff. So our variety of tree species makes us susceptible to all these different types of pests out here. So uh, job security for a forest health specialist anyway. So um, it is getting close to my bedtime. I like to go to bed a little bit early, not, not necessarily seven o'clock, but I do get tired faster these days. But um, used to just go to bed, but now I, this, this kind of cracked me up because whenever I lay down, all of a sudden I remember everything I should have done or didn't do or I did wrong that I thought I did right. So I guess that time's getting a little bit closer here to this evening. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is sudden oak death. And there's, it's a very interesting disease complex thing to talk about because First of all, it's not very sudden. Oaks don't die suddenly from sudden oak death. It's actually very slow. It um, doesn't necessarily mean oaks because it actually affects a lot of other host species. And death for most other plants, it doesn't cause mortality. So the name sudden oak death is kind of a very big misnomer, but it sounds real scary and it gets people's attention. And so that's where you get uh, funding from the government agencies and stuff. So it, uh, it's definitely made the press, made the newspapers and uh, got people's attention. And in California and out West Oregon, Washington state, it is definitely killing a lot, a lot of trees. It's um, causing lots and lots of problems out there. Fortunately for us, that doesn't seem to be the case at this time. One thing, it, it's kind of hard to tell what you have with sudden oak death because this is actually the canker here which looks like pretty much every other canker that can get on an oak tree. And this is the oozing that the canker causes on the bark. Um, this is where the bark's peeled away. This is with the bark still on it. And that looks like a lot of other oak trees have this all the time from just other injuries, issues, and things like that. So it's very hard to identify. So there are, like I said, there's a bunch of host plants for sudden oak death, we call it SOD. I uh, have to use acronyms as much as possible to make us feel intelligent and like we were smarter than everybody else, but um, over a hundred species that this um, pathogen can live on. And what's interesting in California, it can live on bay laurel, which is kind of like an evergreen tree as long, along with Douglas fir. So you got hardwood broadleaf trees and you got conifer trees that this, this pathogen can live on, reproduce on. Camellias and rhododendrons are the most common ones that you see this pest on. And that's usually from a nursery, nursery stock situation. And in the, all these plants, it doesn't cause mortality. It can cause some tip dieback back or some blighted leaves and things like that, but it does not kill them. Oops, got a little ahead of myself there. So what does it look like on these other hosts? You've got this leaf right here and it's just a brown spot on the end of the leaf. Um, water kind of helps this disease get established better. It likes moisture. It's a water mold. And so you've got this brown spot there, but that happens with a lot of leaves and same here. So you've, it's, you can't tell that you have sudden oak death. And so the only way you can figure it out is by running a PCR test. So you go and basically get a DNA analysis. So you, it's very expensive to figure out if you have sudden oak death. So you send off the samples to the lab and then they process it. And they, that's the only way to confirm that you have sudden oak death or you don't have sudden oak death. And so this is kind of a map showing 
um, hazard risk of getting sudden oak death. And this was developed um, actually in October of 2002. I know the guy that made this map and I don't think anybody's improved on it. He really likes hexagons for some reason, but you can see out here on the coast, the weather pattern, host type, and those, those factors are prime for sudden oak death. And so we were really concerned 20 years ago about this being here. Uh, we've definitely got the, the prime host, the prime weather conditions, things just would fall into place. So we're a very high risk. Uh, fortunately, um, it doesn't seem to be the case. We, at that time, we sent um, different oak species seedlings to labs out west to have them inoculated with sudden oak death to see how, how severe they would react to it or if they would heal up. And our species were actually um, very much more susceptible than the species they have in the west coast. But for whatever reasons, whether it's environment, that was given the that was given the insect or the disease, the um, benefit of the doubt. It was a, set in the ideal climate, the worst case scenario kind of thing where it had everything it wanted to, to thrive. But apparently, luckily that has not happened in North Carolina. So it could be an environmental factor. It could be our species bark thickness, combination of different things that are keeping that from becoming a problem. So the, like I mentioned earlier, the nursery trade, that's how it got to North Carolina. Uh, so I know death got moved all across the country and it was through, through nursery products. California, it's, it's amazing. I live not far from the mountains here in North Carolina and there's rhododendron, mountain laurel all over the place. And when you go to any nursery, 99% chances that that rhododendron bush came from Oregon or Washington state. Uh, it's just how industry works. It's how things happen and move. And again, there are, are consequences with that. And so what really got everybody worked up was in 2005, uh, there were some large nurseries out West that sent a lot of stock, nursery stock across the country. And all these little black dots are areas where we know that that product was sent. And then these little red dots are places that we know where once we found out those products were sent here, the plant industry folks with the Department of Agriculture, uh, they went and surveyed those areas trying to find if we had any consistent positive sites. And we did have about nine or 10 at that time nurseries with confirmed Phytophthora remorum, which is the scientific name for sudden, or the pathogen that causes sudden oak death. So it did, it did arrive here and along with a lot of other places and all these, these red X's and stuff. So it did come here. The one good thing, I'll get into how we surveyed and, and stuff like that here in a little bit, but even after since 2005 to this point, there has been no native tree that has died. There's only been one native tree that has died from sudden oak death. And I don't even know if that's the case. So what happened was it's, if it's in the nursery and contained and controlled, disposed of, it, it's okay uh, that we don't count those. It's the ones that if it spreads out of the nursery and gets into our natural environment. And it happened to do that somewhere in the South. I wanna say Mississippi, it might've been Alabama, but it did, we did find it. Researchers found the sudden oak death on a tree, on a sapling. And they got so excited, they ended up killing the tree by sampling it to death. So that's the only tree in the whole East Coast that has ever been documented having sudden oak death on it outside of a nursery area. So that's, that's the good news. So hopefully this is not something we have to worry about, but you never know. I know the um, hemlocks, we've been dealing with hemlock woolly adelgid for a long time. It was introduced in Virginia in the early 1950s, and it was 30 years after introduction before it actually became a significant problem uh, with killing hemlocks and things like that. So sometimes things just kind of simmer for a while, build up, build up their uh, population levels, and then all of a sudden it can cause problems. Hopefully that's not the case. But I did want to mention this because there is the one positive, there is still one positive site in North Carolina where it had moved from the nursery into a water source and it is still present in that water source that's down in the Pineville area. And, um, but it's still never, it has not left that water source. We've surveyed it every multiple times, six times a year we go down there and look at it and it has not crawled out of the creek and onto any trees. So that's encouraging, but I did wanna mention sudden oak death because whenever somebody has an oak tree that dies, uh, even folks within our own agency, they say, well, you've got sudden oak death. And that's, like I said, there's only one tree that's ever even had sudden oak death on the East Coast. So it's one of those things, it's more of an education thing. Just, it's such a catchy name that everybody thinks you've got it when something looks symptomatic, it just sticks in your head. 
kind of like a bad name for a rock band or something like that. So um, I mentioned surveys. Initially, we actually, it was a long process trying to figure out how to know if you have uh, that phytophthora that causes sudden oak death. And they found out in the West Coast that it really did well in water. That's where it would float in the water. It would catch onto the leaves that were dipping in the water from trees on the bank. Then it would infest those leaves, infect those leaves, and it would just kind of go up and out of the, the bank and into the trees and into the forest. So they found different ways to check the water for it. Initially, we floated rhododendron leaves in creeks on these with the little pipes and stuff and sampled those leaves to see if we had sudden oak death in the streams, at least trying to figure it out. That was a neat survey, but it was also very difficult because it just took a couple of kids to come and pick up this bag of leaves and look at it and throw it on the bank. And then we had to start all over again. And you have to leave the leaves out there for one to three weeks. And so it was very cumbersome. And I like waiting in the creeks, but that got a little bit, a little bit too much going on there. So the next thing that we came up with was a bottle of baits. And so they'd actually take some pathologist collected water samples, just one liter of water from this, this little drainage right here. They took that liter of water, stuck a rhododendron leaf in there, left it for uh, about a week, and then sent that leaf off to be sampled. And it was very accurate at finding, determining whether the phytophthora was present or not. And so that's what we're doing now. We're still sampling these creeks, just documenting where it is, where it isn't. It has been found. I don't think it's been found in a creek for the last year or so, but it, the water source has been dried up or well. Um, the creek is almost dry. So that I guess if it's dried up, then we don't have to worry about it, the autothera uh, working any worse. But um, that's that's kind of where we stand on things. And I think this is getting the things here. My internet's not working good. Hopefully it's going to keep working. But I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so that's pretty much all the, all the bad news I could come up with for a 45 minute or hour presentation. Uh, so if there's any any questions or whatever, I can open up the floor or however however we want to do this. But that's that's all the talking I've got going on for right now. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, so we do have a question in the chat um, from Christine, and it's for the spotted lantern slide. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I got to take my squeaky toy away from my puppy um, <laughs> for the spotted lantern fly. Um, in Asia, where they're native, do they have a predator? Probably. We don't know what it is yet since it just got introduced here um, back in 2014. I'm sure there are researchers going on there to look at it but I don't know what that is at this point. I'm not sure if they know either. It's something that's always, whenever you get a new forest pest or agriculture pest, you do try to figure out if there is a native predator. A lot of times it takes about 10 years just to determine what the best native predator is because there you've got lots of generalist predators, things like that. Is it a specific to this pest? Is it not? Things like that. So you have all of these things going on to consider and analyze and look into. I don't know of anything right now I'm sure it's being looked at, but it's it's one of those things that it's it's going to be a long ways off when if and when that does happen. Um, next question: If you see a spotted lantern fly, uh, should you report it to someone? And if so, who? Yes, definitely want to report it. You can report it to a plant industry under the Department of Agriculture. They're actually the lead agency in this but also the Forest Service, uh, we, we work together in a lot of these things. And so if you wanna call your Forest Service, your county ranger or forester, let them know. You can also go to Cooperative Extension. We're kind of, we all work together with each other. And so whoever is the easiest to get up with, uh, they will try to do their best to help you out. And, and we wanna definitely document it, see where it is. And if it's a, hopefully we'll, at the very initial stages, we will try to go out there uh, some us plant industry, whoever try to go out there and uh, determine how bad the infestation it is to eliminate, to eliminate the uh, area where it's established and see if it's something that we can control knock out while it's small before it gets too big. Uh, that's, that's our objectives is to try to knock it out before it gets established as much as possible. 
other states have tried it, they've failed, but we're still, I mean, it's our responsibility to try our best and see if we can hold it off for as long as possible. All right. Um, what is killing the hemlocks in the mountains? So that is the hemlock woolly adelgid. And I've spent a lot of time dealing with that pest. It's, it's one of the more um, heartbreaking kind of pest. I, hemlock's one of my favorite trees and to just watch them all die gradually over the last 20 years. Um, it is a, in the natural environment, it is killing and has killed a ton of hemlocks. There are treatment methods if you want to save your hemlock, if you have an individual tree, kind of like emerald ash borer, you can treat an ash tree, you can treat a hemlock tree with the same chemical, and it's very successful. You can actually have um, five to seven years of control just with one treatment, so it's not something you have to treat every year. You can treat it very inexpensively, probably 20, 20 cents an inch in diameter. So it's a very inexpensive treatment. You have to do it at the right time. I, and I can give you more information if you do need treatment information. But it's the hemlock woolly adelgid. It got brought in from Japan, got brought, carried into Virginia in the early 50s. And since then it spread and it's, it's killing lots and lots of hemlocks. And North Carolina just got devastated because about the time the hemlock woolly adelgid showed up, we also had a drought and that really stressed the hemlocks out and gave the adelgids a, an upper hand. And so they got a really uh, strong foothold in that. Uh, one thing I can brag about a little bit is that the uh, North Carolina Forest Service and Department of Agriculture and the Hemlock Restoration Initiative have treated over 60,000 hemlock trees, mostly on state-owned properties, so that we can maintain those trees for research, for future seed sources, for genetic diversity, um, things like that down the road, because it is something that hopefully once we find a balance somehow, we can introduce hemlock back into our environment. It's a very critical, important tree along streamsides, riparian zones, things like that. And so there, there's research on that. There's also some biocontrol things going on with that as well that seem uh, hopeful. So, so we're trying to save the tail end of the hemlocks and maybe get them uh, coming back again. So that kind of leads into the next question um, of doesn't the emerald ash borer treatment kill a lot of beneficial insects as well? There's always the risk. The, the main thing for ash trees and for the hemlock trees, the way we're treating is systemically. So systemic treatments means for what we're doing, we're doing a soil drench. So you pour the chemical right at the base of the tree. So it's not going out to the drip edge. It's very concentrated. It kind of penetrates the barks or gets into the root system really quickly. And then it goes up into the tree. So you will have some minor secondary insect damage where you've poured the chemical into the soil. You will have a little bit of damage there. You'll have a little bit of damage on anything that feeds on the leaves or sucks the sap mostly. So if they're sucking the sap, then you can have some damage to um, non-target insects. But most of the time, it's, it's pretty much you're going after what you need to go after. There's always going to be a little bit of secondary, but it's not like you're spraying an entire tree with a foliar application and you're killing all the bees and all the other insects that are on the tree, it's specifically those that are, are actually piercing into the, the needle or the branch or the leaf. And those are the ones that have, are getting the chemical. So it's, it's not, I'm not a huge fan of just putting chemical on everything, but you have to look at the environmental results. Is it what benefit versus the benefit ratio, benefit loss ratio. And you try to figure that out. Uh, for hemlocks, for me, it's a no brainer. Um, any kind of chemical risk that you have with treating the hemlock to me is totally wiped out because you have a hemlock tree on the soil bank that's protecting the water quality, protecting the, from erosion, things like that. When you've seen hemlock trees that have been left, not been treated and the, they fall over, they land halfway in the creek, the root ball gets exposed, you have erosion, you get more sunlight to the water. So there's always a give and take whenever you have to do any type of chemical or preventative treatments and you just have to figure out what's, what the benefit cost ratio is for that. All right, um, next question is, should wood from dead ash trees be disposed of in any special way? Not really. We used to say try to dispose of it um, locally. You could burn it up or something like that to try to 
reduce the potential spread. At this point, it's so widespread across the state that it's not going to do anything. So we've lifted our quarantines. At one time, we had a quarantine to try to prevent it from getting where so you you couldn't move ash wood from one county to the next. Now it's it's pretty much, unfortunately, it's just like we we give up on this. We call uncle and it's it's over. So however you want to dispose of your ash wood is, is absolutely fine. There's no no good guidance, bad guidance or anything like that. Um, so I meant to mention this earlier. If anybody would like to come off of mute and um, actually ask their question out loud. If you'll raise your hand, then you can do that or you can continue to um, type questions into the chat box. Right now, I think we've answered everything, but if anybody else has any other questions, um, just raise your hand and we can turn you off of mute so that you can ask those out loud. Chat from Christine just saying, Super information and another one from Sonia saying great information. Um, so if nobody else has any questions, then that is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much, Brian, for being with the Union County Wildlife Chapter tonight. Um, I mean, flexible. Yes, not a problem. And um, if anybody has any further questions that they start thinking about later tonight, you can either email me. I will put my email in the chat right now. Um, and I will make sure that it gets to Brian and, oops, sorry, trying to multitask and talk and type at the same time. I can't um, do that at all. <laughs> but if anybody would like to email me, I will make sure that it gets to Brian and we will get your questions answered for you. Um, so if that's it, thank, thank you everyone and have a good night. Yep, thank you. <laughs>